I'm going to the park. You want to join? Yeah. Let me just get my gloves and bonnet and maybe a parasol. Hang on. Didn't we film almost this exact intro last year? Oh, yeah, I guess we did do that for the video about the Victorians and modesty. You couldn't come up with anything new? Look, it's not my fault so much of historical modest dress was about sun protection. I just tell people about it. You're supposed to be good at this. Do y'all still need us or? I guess not. Go take a break or something while I try to rewrite this. You could just get on with the video. They'll get the point. Welcome to summer in California, friends. The season in which, despite me not being a natural ginger, my complexion reminds me how determined it is to make me a convincing fake. I am in a constant battle to enjoy the sunshine while avoiding sunburns by every means I can employ. So of course, it's time to go down the rabbit hole of sun protection through fashion history, how suntans went from unfashionable to stylish, and what people did to avoid sun damage in the days before SPF ratings were a thing. I mostly talk about clothes on here, but before I started my channel, I was a cosmetologist and a massive skincare nerd. While I am not a cosmetic chemist on the level of, say, Lab Muffin, I've spent a lot of time reading ingredients lists and scientific papers. If you want the receipts for this video, keep an eye in the top corners for on-screen citations. For my fellow research lovers, I publish annotated bibliographies with all my source notes on my Patreon, which you can check out up there. Joining the Patreon also gets you other shiny bonuses like early video releases, monthly video chats, and access to the Snappy Dragon Discord server to hang out with our fellow costumers. And it really helps support the channel. It's also super helpful to tell YouTube you like what you're seeing and share this video with your friends, especially if you know someone who's always complaining about how much they hate wearing sunscreen. Not going outside is a perfectly valid strategy. Not all of us get to sit on the couch all day making snarky comments like you. We have jobs and social lives and stuff. I have a job. Yeah, yeah, making snarky comments while sitting on the couch. We know. While I may not spend all day sitting on the couch like that one, rest and good sleep are super important in between all my sunny summer excursions. So thanks, Birch Living, for sponsoring today's video. Their Labor Day early access sale is live now, so be sure to head to my link in the description to check them out. Birch makes mattresses that are crafted with responsibly sourced materials, such as organic cotton, organic wool, and 100% natural latex. Their mattresses are free from polyurethane foams and fiberglass. They own their manufacturing facility and keep it entirely free from fiberglass because it can be harmful. Instead, they use natural materials that accomplish the same things, like that 100% organic wool, which is flame resistant, hypoallergenic, and biodegradable. We historical costumers are always on about the benefits of natural fibers, and so is birch. They're more breathable, whether in clothes or in a mattress, which helps you sleep cooler when the weather is hot. I have the Birch Lux mattress, which comes with an impressive list of third-party textile and environmental safety certifications, GOTS certified, Green Guard Gold, Fair Trade, Forest Stewardship Council. It has eight different layers of organic wool, organic cashmere, organic cotton, and 100% natural latex with a super cushy quilted pillow top. I've had this mattress for a bit over two years, two years of better sleep than I've ever had before. Longtime viewers will know I have some medical conditions that cause chronic pain, particularly in my spine and shoulders. I actually used to get injuries from sleeping wrong, but since getting this mattress, it hardly ever happens anymore. And while no one's back issues are the same, Birch recently did a survey and found that 79% of those who suffered from back pain with their old mattress saw a reduction in back pain with their Birch mattress. These mattresses have a 25 year warranty, so you can look forward to many years of great sleep. And if it doesn't work out, Birch offers a 100 night sleep trial. Plus they'll spare you the back pain of mattress shopping by delivering your mattress right to your door for free, rolled up in a box. For bonus convenience, Birch also offers in-home setup and removal. I love my Birch mattress and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch Living. Their Labor Day early access sale is live now, so it's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 20% off a Birch mattress plus two free EcoRest pillows. Visit birchliving.com slash snappydragon to find out more about this limited time offer. Sunscreen as we know it with SPF filters and such did not start developing until the 1940s. So prior to that, the best way to keep the sun off 
Matthew was with clothing or accessories. I did dig into this in my video about Victorian ideas around modesty. A lot of the fashions we associate with modesty have their roots in sun protection too. If you're trying to keep the sun off you, but need to be out of the shade, wearing long sleeves, a high neckline, and a hat or other headdress to shade your face and neck is very practical. And it does cast things like 19th century Western standards around daytime versus evening women's wear clothes in a different light. It was fine to wear short sleeves, sleeveless or off the shoulder dresses, low necklines and no hat in the evening. There's no sun, so no need to protect your arms, chest or face from sunburn. Now, this was not only about sun protection, in many cultures it did also have a lot of meaning around modesty, both in the sense of covering one's body and in the sense of dressing appropriately according to the norms of a given society. This specific set of norms around covering arms, chest, and head comes up in a variety of places and times. Much of European history, Southwest Asia and North Africa, this is not a comprehensive list. Garments for this purpose didn't disappear from modern fashion, it's just that Western fashion has gone in a drastically different direction with its attitude about dressing for the sun. Clothing for sun protection still exists, both in the form of traditional fashion still worn today, including many forms of headscarves from Southwest Asia and North Africa, and in modern garments like the long gloves, sleeves, or lightweight UPF jackets made by East Asian clothing companies. UPF, by the way, is like a SPF rating for clothing. It's a whole system, but generally more opaque, tightly woven, and darker colored fabrics are more protective than sheer, open weave, or light colors. However, in the world of historical costuming, many Ren Faire folk find that Renaissance shirt sleeves or higher necklines are really helpful. I've most often heard about this from folks saying it can keep you a lot cooler to have the sun not on your skin, which is super important given that Ren Faires often happen in very hot weather. So you may actually be more comfortable in lightweight, airy, higher coverage clothes than low coverage clothes Western culture gravitates to for summer. But given that these are often light colored, lightweight, semi-sheer fabrics, I'd love to hear more about folks' experiences with things like Ren Faire shirt sleeves helping protect from sunburn, given that a lightweight linen or cotton doesn't have a very high UPF rating. Y'all know where the comments are. Tell me your fair sun safety stories. Ooh, bonus tip. If it's really hot outside, you can soak your shirt in water and it'll keep you cooler as it evaporates. How do you know that? You never leave the house. What do you think I do when it gets unbearable in this stupid apartment during heat waves? That's fair. Accessories also played a big role in sun protection, ranging from more mundane and ubiquitous items like hats to parasols to some truly wild items that were only ever used by the upper classes. Hats are another item that exists across a broad range of times and places in an equally broad variety of styles and materials. Again, going back to those 19th century Western norms of daytime versus evening in women's wear fashion, you were expected to wear a hat or bonnet anytime you left your house during the day. But it wasn't as necessary in the evening, especially for formal occasions where you might have a more ornate hairstyle or decorative headdress that provided no sun protection at all. Parasols are another form of sun protection that was far more widespread and commonplace. We have documentation of parasol-like sunshades in ancient Egyptian art dated to around 2450 BCE, which were also used as fans. Not much later, the Victory Stele of Sargon of Akkad around 2310 BCE shows an attendant shading Sargon with a canopy or parasol. They're also documented in China during the Warring States period, the Sanskrit epic Mahabharata in Eastern Europe around 1300 BCE, and in ancient Greece in the late Mycenaean period. Basically, they're one of those things that seems to have been such a good idea that many cultures use them independently, especially in areas that got lots of sun. Consequently, there are so many styles from different regions and time periods. I have my eye on a dark green Battenberg lace parasol from my beloved local fiber arts paradise Lassis. There are some really pretty antique 19th century ones that costumers will often recover, use the frame and make a new fabric shade. The Chinese style paper and bamboo ones are really well known. I personally try to steer clear of those because while East Asian art is gorgeous, Orientalism is never a good look. Speaking of things that are not a good look in the modern world, some of the more intense methods of sun protection 
tradition used by Renaissance European upper classes. These were definitely connected to the classist and colorist association of suntans and freckles with lower status outdoor labor, which we will talk about more later. There was something called a vizard, similar to the word visor, in 16th century England. This is decidedly uncomfy to look at in the context of modern understandings of racism and much of what's happened between now and the 16th century. It was a black mask worn over the face to completely protect the wearer's skin from any sun exposure. Not just uncomfy to look at, seems uncomfy to wear. Yeah, they also look decidedly impractical in the context of modern life, so I am not mad I can use modern sunscreen on my face instead of this much less uncomfy. I learned about the kappa from DSA Thread's utterly hilarious video on it. A black silk veil fine enough to see through worn over the entire head and face. I can see how these are ideal for when you do not wish to be perceived. But they also seem like a pretty natural idea in a society where white linen or silk veils were commonly worn over the hair or head. Dark fabrics do have a higher UPF than light colored ones, so a black veil over the entire face would be more effective to keep the sun off you. None of this looks anything like the sunscreen we know today though. We think of sunscreen as a lotion or other skincare product. Sun protection applied directly to the skin also does go back pretty far outside of the West. I wanna mention a few different traditional sun protection products, but I also do wanna offer some advice to folks looking into historical skincare. Researching non-Western cosmetics as a Westerner, including sun protection, can get tricky because of the sheer amount of Orientalism and exoticism that Western sources talk about them with. Like, did Pacific Islanders use coconut oil in their skin? Probably. Did they do it for sun protection rather than for other skincare uses? Well, coconut oil has an SPF somewhere between two and eight, whereas melanin is between four and 13, so uncertain. On the other hand, there has been a scientific study done on the sun protection properties of Ochize, a skin and hair care product used by the Himba people of Namibia. It's made from butter and red ochre clay and is used for beauty, water-free cleansing, given water can be scarce in the region, and sun protection. The study determined that it had significant UVA and UVB blocking optical properties, hence is an active skin cancer protection. Several similar traditional sun protection cosmetics use other ingredients local to their region, and I apologize for any pronunciation errors. Thanaka is a paste or cream made from the tree of the same name used in Myanmar. It can be applied in decorative patterns or all over, and studies have found that it is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and does provide UV protection, although the exact way it does that isn't clear. Mason Joanie is another wood-based sun protection cosmetic that comes in both white and yellow, used in Madagascar. Similarly, it can be applied in decorative patterns or on the whole face, and it is also used to repel insects. Borak, which is used by the Samabajo people in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, is made from rice flour plus a variety of other ingredients. In the photos I've seen, it's either a yellow or greenish color and is applied all over to the face and neck. The only potentially sun protective cosmetic I know of in the Western world prior to the beginnings of modern sunscreen is the use of titanium dioxide in white tinted face powders. This was far from the only white tinted ingredient used in Victorian complexion makeup. And furthermore, a powder tinted with titanium dioxide probably would not provide very good sun protection. Titanium dioxide is one of the mineral UV filters still used in sunscreens today, but the formulation is tremendously important in making it effective. I highly recommend Lab Muffin's videos on the issues with homemade sunscreens for more info. I don't know about you, but my nerdy cosmetologist self finds this stuff fascinating. Lab created muffins? Are we getting snacks? No, it's a YouTube channel name. Oh, but now I'm hungry. Then you can bake something. I'm also comfy. I wish you luck with this terrible conundrum. Scroll forward to 1889, when the first of multiple studies demonstrating the link between UV exposure, sunburn, and skin cancer was published by Erich Johann Widmark. Two years later, a Dr. Hammer from Stuttgart in Germany is the first to recommend chemical UV filtering creams to prevent sunburn. His idea was an ointment containing quinine. Dr. Paul Una, another German, studied the link between sun exposure and skin cancer on sailors during the 1890s and developed his own sunscreen in 1910. 
It's in the 1940s that early UV filters were explored in products like Glacier Cream and the infamous Red Vet Pet used by the US Air Force. Swiss chemist Franz Granto developed Glacier Cream after getting sunburnt climbing in the Alps, and his company also appears to have developed the SPF system used today for measuring UV protection. But it wasn't until 1978 that the American FDA began to regulate sunscreens. Around the same time, UV tanning beds started popping up. Since then, sunscreens have developed considerably. The original Glacier Cream had an SPF of around 2, whereas now broad spectrum SPFs of 30 to 50 are common. Attitudes towards suntans in the Western world changed in the 1920s. And while I normally don't love the great man theory of history that attributes culture-wide shifts to individuals, I will happily blame much of the popularity of tanning on fashion icon and literal feminazi Coco Chanel. She returned from a Mediterranean vacation having gotten a sunburn that faded to a tan, and through her fans and the association with luxury and leisure, the look became popular. Although it's not all Chanel, some of this shift was due to the popularity of caramel-skinned entertainer Josephine Baker among Parisian fans. Here's the thing though, Josephine Baker's coloring wasn't a suntan, she was black. This pattern, where racialized features on black celebrities are emulated and considered fashionable on white people, continues today. This was a major reversal though, since through most of the past, and in many cultures today, lighter skin was or is considered desirable due to the association with not having to do outdoor low status labor. This preceded the sort of racism that arose when the West started colonizing and enslaving all over the place, but has definitely intersected with it since. Add that to the list of reasons we should not have racists like Coco Chanel as fashion icons. Do we need more reasons on that list? I think we've got enough. Well, no, but I don't really think you can dislike them too much. Yeah, I guess you're not wrong. So in the West, after the 1920s, suntans developed these new connotations of luxury and leisure to spend time outdoors or at the beach. Paleness was associated with nerdiness and lacking a social life that would get you out of the house. Additionally, the Industrial Revolution shifted the more low status forms of labor in Western society from outdoor work like agriculture to indoor work like factory and service jobs. But many areas didn't experience this cultural shift around suntans, including East Asia, where pale even skin is still considered the standard of beauty. Modern Korean and Japanese sunscreens are some of the best and most cosmetically elegant, meaning pleasant to use. But from what I've read, this is coming from a lot of time spent on beauty and skincare subreddits back in the day, part of the reason these sunscreens are so pleasant and highly developed is the persistence of colorism in these cultures, motivating people to wear sun protection daily to prevent tanning and hyperpigmentation. Not the only reason, and I've been using Korean sunscreens for years because they really are just nicer. You can object to colorism and still use the good stuff. So now we come to the point. Why does sun protection matter, even if we reject these historical and continuing ideas about suntans? Well, skin cancer is bad for you and sunburns are painful. If you can protect yourself from medical issues ranging from uncomfortable to deadly by putting on clothes or magic protection lotion when you spend time outside, it seems kind of silly not to. A lot of us US folks particularly expect sunscreen to be heavy, greasy, and uncomfortable, and thus prefer not to wear it unless they have a reason to, consequently going without any sun protection. Part of this is because the US FDA that regulates sunscreens literally has not approved a new UV filter, the ingredients that provide the sun protection in sunscreen, for 22 years. Meanwhile, countries with more up-to-date regulatory bodies have improved newer, more comfortable UV filters, allowing for far more comfortable sunscreens. This is among the reasons why sunscreens imported from Korea or Japan are on average far more pleasant to wear than American-made ones. But it's good to know you have a whole variety of options for how to protect yourself from the sun, especially if the sunscreens available to you are uncomfortable. Everything from age-old methods like staying in the shade, wearing lightweight clothes that cover you, and big hats, to modern highly developed sunscreens from places with up-to-date regulators. I've finally started using my building's pool this summer, and I am enjoying the combination of modern sunscreen for my face and shade or loose clothes on my body, 
so I don't have to reapply sunscreen or gunk up the pool water. Similarly, I've gotten great use out of my big sun hats, historical and modern, to avoid having to sunscreen my neck and shoulders, and I am really looking forward to getting that green lace parasol for long outdoor events. I wish a very bright, warm, toasty but not burnt rest of the summer to all of us in the Northern Hemisphere, and in like six more months to everyone in the Southern Hemisphere. And now we all have years of fashion history giving us ideas for how to avoid getting burnt. If you too are a cosmetics nerd and want the scientific studies and such, you can get my full annotated source notes at patreon.com slash snappydragonstudios, as well as the exciting bonus video chat sewing circles and Discord access. Don't forget to tell YouTube you liked what you saw and click the subscribe button for more fashion history fun on whatever schedule I manage to publish on it. Tell me in the comments about your favorite ways to safely enjoy the sun. It's time for me to go splash around in the pool, practice my very questionable swimming, and then flop in a lounge chair and read. See you next time. All right, I'm ready for the pool. You coming? You're going outside like that? You filmed that last year too. Just take the sunscreen and go. I have a book I want to finish.